Welcome to Big Blend Radio's first Friday Toast to the Arts and Park show with the National Parks Arts Foundation, who are known for their amazing artist residencies in parks across the country. Welcome, everybody. We're excited to go back to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park for the latest artist in residence interview. And that is with Leah Newsom. She is a writer. She is also teaches creative writing. And so we're going to talk about her work. And also, I do believe she's working on a novel. A uh, little birdie told me about that. So and I've heard that you've got nice birdies, like little tweet tweet birds out there in Hawaii. So welcome, Leah. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, you bet. You bet. So what's it like going from Phoenix where, where you're raised, right? You're born and raised there, right? You're an actual yes. zoni. You're a real zoni. One of the like few. It's rare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's rare. She's a true zoni. Okay. But what's it like going from there, the desert, you know, to also Hawaii Volcanoes National Park where it's it's got the ruggedness, right? In some of the mountains, but it's different. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I didn't really know what to expect because obviously, you know, photos online can do no justice and um, just coming here and driving every five minutes on the road is a completely different space and a completely different sort of biome and environment. And so I think I spent the first couple of days sort of in awe of, of how, how strange it is, how different it is. And it, it, it wasn't until we started driving through, um, to get to the uh, to the National Park, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, um, you have to drive through Kotlu Desert, at least from the side of the island we're on. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, it's high desert. It looks like Prescott here. It's like, oh, wow, you know, really? when, oh, yeah. yeah, the the like the Saguaro stop and you're sort of like on the rim and there's there's like one part of this island that looks almost exactly like high desert Arizona until you look a little further and then you see the ocean behind it, right? <laughs> then it's like, whoa, it's, okay. But I always say, you know, the desert, you know, sharks used to swim out there, man. Come on. They did. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, a geological baby, right? It's like the most recent thing up from the water. Yeah, it's kind of, it's it's neat to go to those kind of, you know, drastic difference and find all those similarities, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those connections. Even in the park itself, too, like walking through the the craters, you know, you come out of the rainforest and then boom, you're met with this sort of vast landscape of mm. kind of nothingness. And it's wow. um, desert like, but not quite the same. It's kind of su surprising and beautiful. You know what we find different about not being in Tucson, you know, where we're based, we're based out of and kind of based out of, but traveling so much is we noticed, you know, I was talking about birds at the beginning here. I'm going back to it. There's very few doves. Like I, we, when we see a dove back east or some other area, we're like, "Oh my gosh, there's a dove!" Like it's kind of weird. You know what I mean? People look at us and we're like, because I'm so used to the big, you know, white winged doves, and you know. So what's it like in regards to just the, you know, the general wake up in the morning and hear birds where you are? Yeah. So weirdly, my house in Phoenix, we joke about it being sort of like the Audubon Society. I live pretty close to the canal and we have um, a ton of those, um, the lovebirds. Uh, the, oh, like the, the, yeah. The, the little parrots. Cargos. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're loud as heck and they're screeching cool. all day long. It's very loud outside my house in Phoenix. Here, the first morning I woke up, it was to a chorus of what had to be hundreds of roosters like cockadoodle doing because <laughs> we're no kind way. of in like <laughs> rural sort of farm yeah. coffee farm land and there's a lot oh, of like cool. cattle farms and stuff and uh wild chickens everywhere and it was a slew of cool. roosters it, it was very surprising I, I don't think I was expecting it but uh, we've seen a few cardinals we've seen really? um, these yeah which I didn't know I was every bird I've been even... looking up like how did it get to Hawaii they're all just people brought them here and then they were oh. escaped pets <laughs> it's kind of like the conures right the lovebirds uh, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh, so, how interesting yeah just it it's seems... different are there doves I gotta ask about the doves yeah I okay so I saw a dove um but it wasn't near the house it was um it, it was like halfway back up to uh, Kona and so it was like a little more city looking um or village like looking than where we're at right now yeah 
<laughs> yeah, it was like, but it was a dove. It wasn't a pigeon. <laughs> but isn't it but, weird to not have them around? It's kind of like, it's just, I don't know. Anyway, just something we've kind of been talking about here is like, where's all the doves? And they're right? little. They were like, are you really a dove? You know, <laughs> are you a dove? Yeah, you but chicken? anyway, <laughs> we should get to writing before I start getting emails, you know, people going like, what, what? You should be talking about a writing. Well, um, <laughs> we'll get there. But it is a different, you know, you know, place to go. So tell us a little bit about your writing career and then we'll get into you being at the park. But like what got you started writing and then going, getting your MFA at, uh, you know, U of A. I mean, you, you really got into it. Was this something you did as a kid? And. Yeah. So um, it's funny because I was talking about this with my mom a couple of weeks ago now that, you know, we're spending a whole month together, which is maybe the first time we've done that since, I guess, since my daughter was born. Um, but I was like, I didn't write when I was a kid, really. But she's like, yes, you did. You wrote all the time. Oh. And uh, so she remembers better than I did um, or than I do. So I, for me, I remember very explicitly writing like in high school. Um and I wrote like lots of very sad poems in high school because I was a yeah, very moody teenager. Yeah, we're all good teenager. at that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I think everybody wrote a sad poem when they were a moody teenager, right? Um, I just like didn't stop doing it, I guess. Um, though I switched to fiction writing. I was a very poor college student. I didn't like, I went to community college. I dropped out a gajillion times. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do other than write, but I was like, writing doesn't make any money. No one can have a career doing that. Um, and eventually I was like working in retail for a really long time and in service industry jobs. And I thought, oh, I really don't want to have to answer a phone being like, thank you for calling the store. This is Leah. How can I help you? Uh, like when I'm 30. And so I was like, I'm just going to go back to school for writing. And that's what I'm going to do. And we're just going to see what happens. So I did, and I did it really hard. And when I finished undergrad, I didn't feel done. So I applied to grad school and did that again. And I think uh, I, I'm i a good learner. I'm an interested mm-hmm. learner. Um, I That's like that's where a, my brain- That's a quality to have in life, yeah. Yeah, I just, I feel like I, I just want to absorb information as much as possible. So um, going to school for as long as I did was- um, great for me at that time. Um, mm. And, you know, I wrote a lot of stories in grad school and I published a lot of stories and it just seems like it's one of the few things that sort of came, I don't know if I would say it came naturally to me, but it, it came with a lot of energy and okay. I was willing to put the effort in. Yeah. Cool. And then you got into the world of teaching from all of yes. that. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. you can so... have a career. And you're in a living <laughs> as a writer. It's possible. It's possible. Mm. Yeah. So I have I have sort of two jobs at ASU and I, I teach creative writing and I um, also work at the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies and I do a lot oh. of um, content development and uh, oh. writing for people who are trying to think about our futures through the histories of our past. That's cool. Like that, that's a rabbit hole kind of thing. It is a rabbit hole. Yeah. I I hand that out there very gracefully. Yeah. Yeah, No, 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 no. Because I mean, that's why we're the blend. We can't stop like, well, this is interesting. Well, this is interesting. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, I think, God, it's like, that's the way to live. And the more we learn, the more exciting it is. And then it's like, wow, look at that. But going back our historic past of so many walks of life right and the natural history that's got to be kind of touching you know going from Arizona's cultural history and then going you know to Hawaii do you find any similarities ah you know I I don't know if there's so much like obvious similarities as like notable um sort of little pings in time right uh Arizona and Hawaii are two of the last um states to become states right with the exception of alaska and so the sort of like colonial histories of both places are like happening roughly around the same time um but they look very different uh Mm. and i i think that's incredibly fascinating and when i i gave a talk at the kahuku unit um last week about the history of tuberculosis and health tourism and health colonialism in Arizona, which is sort of what my novel is thinking about a little bit. Um, And to listen to some of the folks 
some of the native Hawaiians talk about their experience with the like colonial endeavors that brought the U.S. to Hawaii. It's like it's very different, mm -hmm. um, but all rooted similarly. Right. So it's it's sort of like what do they say in Southeast Asia? Same, same, but different. Like we yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're kind of dealing well, with similar I, issues. Have you heard of Molokai? Have you, Molokai. Molokai. Yeah, in Hawaii, then um, there's a leper colony out there. There was yes. a leper colony. And there's another yeah. park dedicated to, and I'll butcher it in pronunciation, so I won't. But um, <laughs> it, it it is, like, it's fascinating to me about that. Like, in, you know, Louisiana, off of Avery Island, where the land of Tabasco, like the Tabasco, there's a leper colony up there. Which is, yeah. it's, I don't know what, I shouldn't say that's cool, but now we know what, you know, medicine and everything but how we banished people to islands we literally do and when we think about things we go oh you know certain political people can we just put them on an island but then I'm like no I want the island <laughs> <laughs> just put me on an island you know yeah I'll just be away from it so it's kind of <laughs> interesting about that kind of thing and colonialism in Hawaii is definitely fascinating yeah That's, yeah that runs deep and complex and complicated not just complex, so complicated. complicated, yeah. And sort of ongoing, like unresolved. And it's true of Arizona as well, but it has a different, um, mm. I mean, I suppose for lack of a better word, Ooh. flavor or, you know, um, uh, it, it. I think there's also- Control uh, mechanisms of human control, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I there's, I, I was talking to somebody while I was giving the talk and they were like, "What? what does- you know, you've been hanging out here, you've been talking to Native Hawaiians, how does that feel or ring with the indigenous peoples of Arizona? And I was like, well, it's really different. I mean, in Arizona, we have reservations mm -hmm. and Hawaiians are not considered an indigenous tribe by the federal, you know, by the federal government. So they don't receive the same kind of, um, I mean, on one hand, they don't have the long same history of that kind of reservation sort of manipulation but they also don't have the financial support that comes with you know or the autonomy that comes with reservation um uh you know like tribal governances and stuff so mm. it's a, it's a very weird different experience i think and some some tribes said no to the reservations and bail like some of the Paiutes in California are like no screw you I'm off you know yeah. I'm not doing it you're not going to trap me around and put me in this thing and, and they, rightfully so yeah yeah so it's kind of interesting I've, I've met some you know uh just talking about that and and they're like no we decided not to which means we didn't get any support whatsoever and you're kind of living in the shadows in a way and it's like you know. between a rock and a hard place. Like what, what, what do you give up in order to get the resources you need? And yeah, I mean, I don't, these histories are awful, right? And well, they're... yeah, when slavery is like, okay, we free slaves and now can we help with education when they were banished from learning anything, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's such a, um, I think we forget about that lack of education that happened to, to those who went through slavery that mm -hmm. you know you're not allowed to learn you're not allowed to do this and sharecropping families of all walks of life a lot of times didn't get the education either you know i, I met a sharecropper fam uh, he's a descendant of but also lived it as a kid and in in louisiana and he said my parents went to school with me we all went to a one room school uh, on sundays or whatever it was yeah i think it was whatever on the weekend they all went together everybody all ages so they were all at the same pace of education that's kind of right. wild and they all wanted access to it right mm -hmm. he turned out to yeah. be an engineer he did it uh served in our military Good turned out to be a really big engineer big in genealogy helped save uh his family's sharecropping cabin um at cane river creole national historical park it was like one of the last ones and then the other side of the park a different plantation they have um the last i think the only uh brick slave quarters in louisiana oh my god and you go in there man it's yeah it's deep you, just, yeah, you get the vibes so man you, you know it's <laughs> i mean those ghosts don't go away like that's that's uh yeah some places you know all places hold their histories right um as a writer when you go like what you're doing in hawaii are you i mean obviously more observant than a lot of us because you write and it's like oh well that's interesting but 
I mean, is that kind of, are you, how do you keep all that going? Cause if you're taking everything in, like how, how do you make your brain into a database to pull it? I, do you take notes? <laughs> like it is like, it, it's, you know what I mean? When you're bringing history in, and we should touch on your novel too, but um, yeah, that observe, observing it, like, is it important for you to have like tactile, you know, connection to things as well. So you get like the texture of the earth and you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think, um, so I used to take notes, right? I would, if, if something of interest happened or someone said an interesting bit of dialogue, I mean, it's not dialogue when you're eavesdropping, they're just talking, but <laughs> it became yeah. dialogue for me, right? I used to take notes in my notes app and I just have like a full notes app full of sort of eavesdroppings or, you know, noticings. Um, but I, I, I sort of stopped doing that after a while because I actually found... It didn't help me remember anything. Um, and it's out of context, in a way. Yeah, out of context, and I, um, I don't know. It just it, it, something about it felt like too, like I was like catching Pokemon or something. Like there was like a too much of a game to it, or it felt like I was collecting things. Um, and now I just sort of trust that you know, if I see something interesting or I experience something interesting, it'll find a way back out um or it'll nag at me until I figure out how to do something with it so I think um mm. uh I, I'm just sort of like yeah. trusting my subconscious to like hold my interests together and it, it 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 has done me well so far in like the last I don't know five or six years um you'll be surprised when you're sort of in flow state of writing like what will come back to you um and so I, 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 I'm just assuming that my brain is more complicated than I am aware mm. of. And I'm just saying, so you, you have to trust your, trust your brain to know what is a good rabbit hole. Should I go in door yeah. number two or number five? You know, <laughs> like, right. You know. Right. And well, and when you're writing a novel, it's like all doors, right? You're like every single oh, door, yeah. please, please just come in here. I need you. <laughs> Tell us about your novel. Are you, are you able to, or? Yeah, yeah. So this is all um, hush hush behind door number seven. You know? No, I have no secrets. <laughs> um, I think so. It's a novel I started maybe in all earnestness about a year ago, but I'd been thinking about uh, really since the beginning of the pandemic because um, I started doing research into Arizona's tuberculosis history and history of sanatoria in Arizona, and um, it's endlessly fascinating. And I won't take up this entire podcast relaying it all because I could talk about it for days. But um, <laughs> I I was interested in um, the ways in which people were so desperate for the kind of care that they needed during mm. the early 20th century um, when there was no real cure, a kind of very spotty systems of treatment um, and they all came to the Southwest because they believed that the arid climate would cure the consumption. Um, but they came to a territory that was not a state that didn't have federal and state funding that, uh, only had a few select private sanatoria, um, that like you had to be a part of like the Freemasons or the Catholic church or something like that to Ooh. be admitted oh. to. And so most people ended up living in tent cities and slums, um, that were being constructed around the city in the desert at the time. And um, many of the neighborhoods in Phoenix now are neighborhoods that were developed from those initial moments. So Sunny Slope is a tent city, uh, tuberculosis tent city, and that's how it wow. became sort of the impoverished part of town that it is. You don't and hear about with, this that often. I know. I, I mean, wow. you know, Arizona public education does not have a reputation for being particularly thorough, but I was stunned to have not known about any of this and south phoenix the that's same a was rabbit also... hole i'd go crazy yeah yeah and i think i did i was just like shoop and reading everything i can looking through uh arizona historical society like um uh, databases and everything they have available online the arizona memory project just like really 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 obsessive and the big question i was asking was why why would someone subject themselves to this kind of care or this kind of sort of um, lack of care, really? Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and I thought, you know, this is like an utter act of desperation, which is also an utter act of optimism. And I was, I was kind of floored by, um, sort of the idea of being willing to move yourself this far West, um, into, you know, a climate that gets to 120 some odd degrees and sleep outside and all in the hopes of sort of like curing something about yourself. Mm. And so I started writing a novel that is loosely based on these questions. It's not about tuberculosis, um, but it is about a, a group of women who are at a sort of treatment center in the desert. Oh, wow. And um, they are being treated um, for, I guess I would call it an unnamed illness, but I actually think it's more of like, a goal to expand their consciousness. So um, I'm thinking about the ways in which we talk about mental health on TikTok mm-hmm. or the ways in which we're all so interested in like um, brain. our brains and like, mm-hmm. how do we, you know, I'm going to build a second brain and I'm going to do all these um, memory tricks so that I have a super brain, like some kind of Elon Musk business tech guy vibe where it's like all my stuff's going to be my super brain and have an x and, on our forehead right. <laughs> and driving our electric cars into space um yeah but i want I'm a saber inter- <laughs> <laughs> yeah fire from my saber yeah. yeah get back yeah i think but i think it's interesting how we think we can like optimize ourselves um and mm-hmm. i think in some ways we've always been trying to optimize ourselves even uh yates and the um what 16th century 17th mm-hmm. century was making his memory palace um and so i think i think like humans are always trying to like optimize what is inherently just like a a sack of meat and bones Why meditation is all part of that too like the transcendental meditation so there's a mm-hmm. book it's called super mind or super brain one of the two uh by dr norman rosenthal he's been uh oh wasn't bomb oh it's not in front of me so anyway I better go start meditating and get my my brain there but he actually <laughs> was the one who um figured out sadness as uh you know uh sad it's a seasonal affective disorder mm-hmm. and Norm Rosenthal yeah he's been on our show like a number of times and he because of transcendental meditation they were able to over the years actually study people's brains and they started mm-hmm. into this. And this is now we've had like 50, 60 years of research or something. And it turned out our brains were like muscles and actually really got stronger. Like the cranium got harder and like from this form of meditation. And you, the book is fascinating of all these experiments and everything of how they've been doing this. And yet this comes from, you know, India, from, you know, the, just the Swamis brought it over. So this is an ancient thing. And so, but yeah, it's fast. All that stuff is fascinating because we have been doing it. I mean, even when you think of the word sanatorium too, doesn't that kind of freak you out? Like we went um, in Asheville, North Carolina, we went where the sanatorium was, where um, Ella Fitzgerald, not Ella Fitzgerald, Zelda, ah, Zelda, Zelda, Zelda. Oh, Zelda Fitzgerald. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't too far. Yeah. (laughs) Where she, she died. In, and yeah. they were zapping their brains at the time, right? So that's when they did that, zzz, you know, we're going to electrocute yeah. your brain. Electric shot there. But she didn't die through that. She died through a kitchen fire. And well, because there was a fire in the kitchen and she was in her holding cell to on her way to be zapped or shocked. And that's not the correct term, everybody. Um, and so the kitchen caught on fire and they went on the fire escape was wooden. And so they perish. Oh, good. And, yes. and, and, and there's times, so the local mythology is when you go past the area at a certain time of night, you will smell burnt hair. Oh. Ooh. Oh. So, I Awful. mean, you think about that, but then I interviewed a psychologist who said, oh, yes, it's coming back and the, that kind of stuff actually worked. So, you yeah, know, going I mean, this, this stuff is like fascinating because some of the really creepy i mean maybe leeches do work like <laughs> you, you know what i mean i just last week i read an article about a woman who can um smell 
Parkinson's disease on people. She can smell it and thus can diagnose people even before they've actually shown any symptoms of Parkinson's. And they did a bunch of research. This is in the New York Times. It's like, meet the Mm -hmm. woman who can smell Parkinson's or something. Um, And uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about is like, you know, a sensory experience of the world has been a like uh, medical, for lack of a better word, or like health process for communities, presumably since the dawn of time, right? Like yeah. that, you know, it's not, we haven't been diagnosing things with um, machines and, uh, you know, blood samples and, you know, things like that. We've We've known about like health and the inner workings of people through sensory experience. And we can attribute like dogs can sniff out cancer and like, Mm -hmm. so can rats or something like that. So like, it's, why is it so hard to believe that people could do it? Right. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing it. I mean, I think this woman has a a superhuman sense of smell. Yeah. Because I don't think I can smell Parkinson's, but it doesn't mean that like people can't or that people are somehow inherently incapable. We've been doing this stuff since humans. We've been doing all kinds of stuff. People with the, the being able to. Um, you know, here, like through color, they have like all that weird, you know, I can't Anesthesia remember that. sort of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. That stuff's cool, man. Come mm-hmm. on. I mean, there's stuff and I think it's about tapping it in, but the more polluted we get with technology and, you know, all these Wi-Fi vibrations, <laughs> I call it, it's my <laughs> new word of the day. All of that stuff clutters the clarity of what yeah. a human being can actually do with their senses i think we have far more senses than what we think and we mm-hmm. just don't know how to quite tap into them and like i said the air is cluttered things are cluttered scent is cluttered because of pollution and things like that so it's going to be interesting as the world turns now with climate change the refugee situation um we're all in a big turmoil right so how are people going to get through this without actually just going and using themselves like that innate survival skill, Mm -hmm. you know, as we move forward. I've been doing a bunch of research on, and by research, I'm a creative writer. So by research, I don't mean I'm like doing uh, studies and uh, whatnot. I'm just reading a lot of stuff, right? So um, I'm going, dang, uh, look at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, and then writing it down and going, boy, don't I know something? And um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I've been reading a book about um, sort of the philosophy of memory and uh, memory sciences and stuff because I think memory is really interesting because we don't know what it is or how it works. And uh, hmm. there was a, a a quote in it from C.S. Lewis. And I have it right here. I wrote it down just in case I needed it. Um, And he says, five senses, an incurably abstract intellect, a haphazardly um, selective memory, a set of preconceptions and assumptions so numerous that I can never examine them more than a minority of them, never become more conscious of them all. How much of total reality can such an apparatus let through? Um, and I, and I'm so fascinated about this idea that like, in some ways our bodies are like a filtering apparatus, right? Like our, our sensory experiences are, are just means of like translating the world as we know it, but there's so much more than like we can Mm -hmm. conceive of. And so, um, what does it look like, um, to acknowledge that the realities that we're aware of are only really a fraction of what's available? See, this is um, why we like sci-fi, right? Yeah, yes. I love sci-fi, big sci-fi See? fan. Yeah. Um, and I mean, at the same time, I'm very suspicious of things like body hacking and I'm very suspicious of like um, opening up sort of like hybrid uh, sort of like uh, cyber human spaces. And I'm suspicious of uh, technologies that- Like AI? Tra- yeah, I think I, I think I'm a little bit uncertain about what the future holds in terms of AI, in terms of um, like uh, uh, biotechnologies, um, where the human and the mm-hmm. non-human interact. Um, I think it's weird. I, I definitely I definitely don't want this book to be like oh boy, we should all start like biohacking and super up our brains 
you know, and I think this book is asking a lot of questions about like, if we cannot see beyond our own perceptions, is there a difference between being aware of that and taking advantage of that and how far is too far? And corrupting and... it and changing it. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. It's kind of what's going on, I think, with AI too. I mean, that is, as a writer, how do you feel about that? Because of the whole, the writing thing is weird. I'm starting to look at stuff going, hello, did you, like, yeah, can I take someone's article that's been submitted, put it in Google and see if you, you know, did that? Did you really write it? Um, all these these um, online places wanting our data to use for AI, I think is wrong because then someone yeah. has got your ideas, your thing. So it's getting, I wonder about bloggers being worried about their blogs, you know, being yeah. used. I'm kind of well, going, I, wanting to go back into print suddenly. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, we should. We should all just get mimeographs and yeah. just, you know, turn them yeah. out and mail mail our stuff, go back to the olden days. I think, um, is it is it Google's Bard? I forget which AI platform uh, took a bunch of um, books, like actually books, and I think that were like in ebook catalogs and was using it to train their AI. And it, this was maybe a year, year and a half ago that all of these writers, um, fiction writers and poets and nonfiction writers, um, there was like a, a Washington Post article where you could go search and see if your book was being used to train AI. And it was like every book you could think of. No. Um, and so some of the questions around, you know, intellectual property are, are deeply there. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I teach college, I, I teach undergraduate classes. I've seen my fair share of chat GPT written um, assignments that I've had to call out because, you know, chat GPT is not sophisticated enough to um, mm -hmm. make it's not arguments. Human. It, yeah. yeah, it doesn't have an opinion. It can only regurgitate what it finds on the internet, right? So it's easy to spot. Um, but it, but the the fear in my mind is that we're already so inundated with um, an inability to read for truth or to read critically online. I think um, we have lots of people who you know they read the thing on Twitter, and so it must be true, um, and that as <laughs> as these algorithms oh, no. algorithm, they, <laughs> they get more sophisticated they uh, look more real mm. you know um if we if we don't have any safeguards against it um that's yeah, it's, terrifying it's, it, it the whole ai thing because look at what photoshop was doing is wanting all the photographers on there to use their art for ai training and then they had ads at the same time Ads going out, advertising campaigns going, oh, no need to go for a shoot. Just come into the studio kind of thing and use their mm -hmm. AI. That is like this. It's like, don't worry about writing. Just, you know, put an idea in and then you. it's insane. Yeah, we'll take everybody's ideas and you can just pick which ones you want. Yeah, I yeah. think. Um... It's, it's insane. So I think like what, you know, you going to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and, and these kinds of programs are crucial that's why i love doing podcasts i know that you can also mess with that but there's at least you know we're both here it's like all right you guys are gonna have to really do some some work to to you know fake this out but the reality is you're actually doing something you're connecting with people with an event your hands on the ground boots on the ground in it where it's not something that you're reading online when you're going to a place like this. So do you feel like you can kind of step out of that bubble, even though you have Wi-Fi and you have all that stuff in a way being in a residency, does that kind of give you this breather moment for clarity away from when we're in our daily lives? Yeah, I think, um, well, I mean, this residency has been particularly uh, great for that because dang it's amazing um, you can go with your mom too which is cool right how, how yeah <laughs> open to that kind of thing which I think is awesome yeah my my daughter and my husband were here for the first week and they just went to the beach like every day um and then they went <laughs> home but uh I think this one is really really interesting and I imagine a lot of the National Park Arts Foundation ones are are interesting in that way like, even I was reading about the one that's like the lighthouse on dry tortugas oh um, yeah 
which sounds wild and uh, a little scary and a little fun. But um, like this house is not in a city. It's not in a town. It's kind of nowhere. Um, it takes about an hour and 45 minutes to drive to the closest Safeway. Um, there's like, there's a fruit stands in the neighborhood. There's like a uh, pick your own bouquet flower garden based on the honor system. And depending on how many stems you picked is how many dollars you put in the box. Right. Wow. Um, I think uh, the one thing I've noticed is that everybody here seems to know each other. Um, when I was at the Kahuku unit giving my talk, the park ranger was there and all the people that came were like, hey, Wendy. I'll see you on Friday. And and so I come from the fifth largest city in the world where we mostly ignore our neighbors and have no honor system. And um, Hell no. You know. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. It, it took me a minute to like sort of, um, I don't know, vibe check, like uh, to remember that like, uh, you know, ignoring people is rude. <laughs> and um, <laughs> why don't you strike up some conversation because you're not, you know, where you're from. And you know, a couple of days ago, we went for a hike um, to get to the Green Sands Beach, which is about three miles away from sort of the closest parking. So you have to like hoof it into there. And uh, we get there and there's a guy, he's sitting on a um, picnic table. He's eating a bagel. Um, he has two ATVs next to him. And he was like, how was the walk? And I was like, you know, long, but nice. And he was like, yeah, we cheated. I drove some people up here. And he was one of the locals that you can pay 20 bucks to give you a ride over oh, there. Cool. Um, and he just started chatting. And he was like, yeah, we used to come here when I was a kid. And there's a steep like rock slope. And he was like, and we would sit on trash can lids and boogie boards and ride our way down. And oh, you know, he just started telling stories. And I was like, this is like a very different sort of chain of the change of pace. But it also is so integrated in the space. Everyone's talking about the land. Everyone's talking about their experience with the place. Mm. And um, like the sort of stories that come with that place. And that's what I've seen since I've been here is everyone I've talked to has been like, yeah, this is this place I'm from. These are the stories I have with this place. It's not even just, you know, Pele, you know, and the the volcano and the mm -hmm. ocean gods and sort of the, I don't want to say mythology because it's very, very real to the, to the people whose mm -hmm. cultures it's a part of, but the stories of how this land came to be, it's not just that it's just Michael boogie boarding down the slope of the green sand beach. Right. Like those are a part of our story. And then and here so we were just talking about AI. It's like opposite. It's the opposite. Like at the actual <laughs> sharing of, of, of uh, real human, human information experience. Yeah. That's and cool. so being able to sort of check out from, you know, Twitter and Instagram and being able to check out from my computer and go for a walk that was three miles away with no cell reception and make friends with Michael for a little bit was, you know, how mo like a lot of people just live their daily lives. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of us in um, who live in uh, big cities and a lot of us who live um in the culture that is uh the internet uh could could use to go for a walk and mm. talk to a guy you find there you know it's it's fascinating and i think that's also kind of part of the park experience because um you know you, we do meet people on the trails and stuff a lot which is kind of cool locals um it and it's um it's great what led you to want to go to hawaii volcanoes and and apply for this when your novel seems to be more on the on the zony side yeah um well i think so <laughs> it's funny uh, like now that i know that there's a saguaro's national park uh residency uh, <laughs> uh, yeah I, I was like well you know that probably would have been actually more fitting but i also don't think i, I would have had as easy of a time sort of like moving my brain out of the space right because okay so you um, have like a pattern interrupt I think so. I needed, I, I needed some sort of like uh, movement away from, you know, the, the land that takes place the in the book hole. because <laughs> the rabbit hole. Yeah. Cause I think uh, my familiarity with the Sonoran desert, I used to spend um, a ton of time on my grandmother's property in, in Whitman, Arizona um, mm. before it, before it was um, houses and stuff. It was just desert in the nineties and, 
she had five acres of land and we used to just run around and catch king snakes and tarantulas and ride ATVs and stuff. And it was all hot and sweaty and kind of frankly, fun. a little dangerous, but fun. Yeah. And <laughs> I think it's something I feel so comfortable with that it's, it's almost hard to write about because I can't like see around it. It's like the familiarity is, mm. is so there that it's almost like a negative landscape at sometimes. And so I think part of coming here has been a great disruption from that. And it, it feels like I can see the Sonoran desert better in my brain by virtue of oh, okay, being away um, from it, being away from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also think, um, again, because of that sort of history of colonialism that like started out this novel, this history of tourism, I was like, you know, going to, um, uh, some of the other parks that were available they they didn't they're they're still within the culture of the continental united states that i was familiar with yeah um yeah and it felt important for me to um go somewhere that i don't know that that was thinking through its colonial histories and its sort of tourism industries mm -hmm. oh yeah um differently than like Florida okay but does it also give you um better insight for your characters because they had to come from somewhere else you know what I mean so yeah now you know what it's like to go somewhere else a completely different culture a different climate you know what I mean you're going somewhere mm -hmm. else and now you have to kind of live in this new place it's different I mean you ain't gonna complain about it I know that but <laughs> I think it's not hard uh maybe we should have sent you to the dry tortugas not me I, I have nothing to do with it but I mean but honestly um just putting yourself in a different living because you're there for a month which is mm -hmm. I, I think pretty unheard of in these kinds of residencies you know to be able to be in a complete new location that you're list you're living there for a month so you can kind of get into the local way of life you know so maybe yeah. that helps with your character development of what they went through and then going back home to to phoenix is going to be completely different because the colors are going to be different now too unless you get some yeah. rain which we all know um well oh, i would those... i would dance in the streets for some rain uh for mm -hmm. phoenix we need it very badly you uh, get those big if... uh, walls of sand what are, what are they called again oh Ooh. the haboob yeah oh man who came yeah. up with that name anyway? I, mean, <laughs> I think it's Arabic. But, um, I don't know. Yeah, I think... always know it's the haboobies coming through. <laughs> the haboobies. <laughs> <laughs> the haboobies. Put your car away. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I think um, like haboob dust in my eyes, yeah. at, like looking east in the in like the sunset is one of the uh, truly most iconic Phoenix uh, sensory experience. <laughs> Her yeah, imagine been... being in a tent city at that time. Right. Yeah. I wonder if it I even mean... happened then, you know, because it wasn't so built up. It might not have been as bad and more vegetation. The I imagine river it was wasn't wetter, as bad yeah. as it is now. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think so much of uh, Phoenix's problems come from the development of Phoenix, right? Um, the, I mean, you know, we obviously don't know why the Hohokam disappeared from the valley, yeah, but a, like, oh, it's a magic story, a magic yeah. story. But people made that place a very livable place for a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the development that is Phoenix is uh, shortening the lifespan of that livable place. Mm -hmm day by day by day and I, I assume that the haboobs are a part of it because they have to do with a lack of moisture right and the lack of rain has to do with the city's heat um and you know I am certain all of that groundwater that we've pulled out <laughs> of the ground isn't helping and and all the gravel yeah. in the yards does not help all that yep. that the rocks you know like put a ground cover down you know mm -hmm. a plant but putting all that gravel in everyone's yards actually raises up the heat index yeah. terribly. You don't, it is not, you know, it drives me I nuts. I think Phoenicians think there's only two kinds of lawns and that's zero scaped or grass. Yeah. And uh, like there's, uh, I actually have a, a neighbor that has a really fantastic, it's, it's soil, it is dirt. And then they have just, it's just covered in, in uh, shrubs and, 
and beautiful trees that are all yeah. a part of our existing yeah. local ecosystem. And so they can live without a significant need of water. Mm -hmm. And their yard is beautiful. You can. We, I mean, we garden in 29 palms outside Joshua Tree. Yeah. I mean, we had an amazing garden. It was absolutely gorgeous and you can do it, but it was, it's different, but I just, I think, and you're, you're going to go, you're going to be kind of bummed going home to Phoenix a little bit, huh? From Hawaii. <laughs> I, think <so. laughs> I think, you know, it, it's funny, you know, uh, thinking about what you said about being here for a month and sort of integrating mm -hmm. into a culture, my characters um, being changed by virtue of that. I've, I've, I've done some residencies that were about this long, um, but they oh, were, okay um when I was in grad school um and I was very fortunate to go to a grad program that like let their grad students do some pretty cool stuff and I, I spent about a month in um, Singapore and Hong Kong and oh, cool. and I was you know just thinking about this like what does it look like to be um immersed in a in a culture and like a place that's so different from where you are from for you know an extended period of time like a month but um I think the thing that's really interesting about Hawaii as a place to do that is that it tricks you into thinking that it is somewhat like your culture by virtue of being in your country. Um, mm. But it's such a different place. Whereas Singapore just felt completely, with the exception of English being a language that is spoken there, it it, it was like the second you get off the plane, you're somewhere else. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and Hawaii has has sort of like a, there's recognition and there's defamiliarity. Mm -hmm. So it's all destabilizing. And I think one of the things that I've been considering for the novel that I'm working on is there's one character who's from the Sonoran Desert who knows it well, who um, knows all the names of the birds and knows all the names of the cactuses and knows and the doves. When, <laughs> and the doves. Knows yeah. where the doves are. <laughs> and and then we have a character who came from somewhere else and doesn't know what anything is or what any of the sounds are. And so the the prose is very different for that character because mm. it's vacant uh, mm. or like everything is new and weird um, and can't be described. And I think I have, a, I have a line in there that says the birds here have no names um, because to her, they, they don't. They don't. And no. yeah. And it, even since, you know, being here, we were at the, we were getting a hot dog yesterday at the local hot dog stand. And uh, the guy that was making our hot dog had like a cardinal that he was throwing bread to. And uh, he was like, yeah, this is my friend. He follows me to work every day. Me and this cardinal are buds. And um, he just like hangs out with them all day. Right. And so to know, like, a feature of your environment so intimately as to have like a daily experience with it mm -hmm. um it's just a different kind of I don't know uh narrative experience. awareness yeah it's a it's a true yeah no no and I think that's it's fascinating We're definitely on the bird sense thing um we used <laughs> to have all the pigeons so when we had our garden in 29 palms all the pigeons right and we fed all the birds. We had all the feral cats. We had the garden, like you wouldn't believe, road runners. Uh, we used to have coyotes come and hang out. It's crazy because the cats would hang up on the roof with the road runners when the coyotes. The came. coyotes, yeah. And so it was like, what are you doing? Like, you know. Um, so it was it was an interesting thing. But the birds, when we ran out of bird seed, right, and we planted a lot of stuff, but like pigeons, and and we thought the pigeons are pretty. I do, anyway. Mm -hmm they would follow the car to the grocery store line up <laughs> and literally flock and fly above the car when I would go home and then go sit and wait and look at me like come on Time now is that not weird <laughs> they actually yeah. flew and came back like with the car that's insane I love that it's yeah. insane <laughs> it's like and and we, I felt like, like we've it, humanized them with the birdseed too. We've humanized them. They recognize right. a car. You're getting in a vehicle. So what are they thinking about the vehicle? Like that's what I wanted to know. It's like, how did you know it was me coming out of the store? How did you know it was that's the car? And they would I'd look up because we had one that was um, kind of like a brown. We called her brownie, and we go hi brownie, you know, and just because she was beautiful, this beautiful kind of brown like a like a light chocolate kind of 
you know, if mm. you put a lot of cream and hot chocolate, like yeah. beautiful. And um, she would be there. And she was the one I knew that this, this was our group. That's very weird. Well, and we underestimate like <laughs> our, our sort of like environmental spaces all the time, right? Crows, if you like make friends oh, with crows, that. you can, they'll bring you little presents, right? Yeah. Like, I think uh, there's, there's so much that we continually underestimate or ignore just because, you know, we live our busy lives and we're, you know, driving to work or whatever, but mm-hmm. we are a part of our environment, whether we like to admit it or not, we are in relationship with all of these mm-hmm. things. I love the story of the the guy with the cardinal because it's those little moments, right? And and when you're reading, a, a, you know, like you you teach this, you know, you you have to build context and character and get to it as quickly as possible, but not. It's those scenes where you can feel like you're in someone's shoes if they're driving to work, and it's you know boring. You have to give that element of boring without describing it boring mm-hmm. for a page, because then mm-hmm. it's going to be boring but you need to have that boredom in there for some reason, whatever the plot is or whatever. So you have to have those little pieces of life that aren't necessarily always yours. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and I, I think this is something I talk to my students about all the time, that old adage of show don't tell um, for creative writing students. I don't necessarily believe that that's really the rule. And I don't, I don't think most people do, but I always encourage my students to think, is there an explanation that I am giving of someone's interiority that could be replaced by a scene where we can like feel it rather Mm -hmm. than be told it, right? So if someone tells you they're sad, that's different than somebody like keeling over and sobbing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so the guy with the cardinal Right. I could be like, I met a friendly guy today and he made me a hot dog. But instead, it's like, you know, this man threw uh, a piece of bread to a bird, a bird he named, a bird he loved, a bird that followed Mm -hmm. him from here to there. Right. And that tells me more about the man than I could ever summarize in sort of like descriptive language. Yeah. There's a a bigger element at play that can't be um, put Mm. into just a summary. Very cool. That's very cool. Yeah, exactly. It's those pieces, their mo, their actions, their connectivity, and whatever they're mm-hmm. doing. Very yeah. cool. Wow. Wow. So, what's been your favorite part of being at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park at at this residency? Because I mean, it's got to be just beautiful. Yeah. Oh, and you, you know, did it in summer. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah if there there might be something really strategic to me missing uh june and Felix, but um i think it's so it's hard to pick a, a, a my favorite thing i i think that um on a really surface sort of like not it, ooh, i made a thumbs up on a really surface not intellectual level um, i didn't do it man yeah i was like mm, okay never mind um like just having the doors and windows open and being able to feel the breeze and like oh. uh, sort of be physically comfortable for a month is an unreal luxury. Um, so that's not a fancy artsy version. That's just a, it's been nice to feel some air. Um, but I think my favorite thing that I have done um, was actually a hike in the national park. Um, it was the Kilauea Iki Trail in the national park that takes you through an old um, closed up lava lake bed. Um, mm-hmm. And so you start by like you're at 4,000 feet elevation and you're hiking through the rainforest and you're just getting sort of lower cool. and lower and lower and lower very wet at that morning we did it it was very foggy it was very you know sort of moody magical very moody and then all of a sudden the the tree line stops and you come out to this expanse of black rock um that goes for I mean it it felt like infinity but I'm guessing it was probably like two miles maybe a mile and a half and while we were walking it was kind of misty it was foggy um it was hard to sort of see the top of the crater. Um, there were all this black rock that is like kind of broken and it's all dried up lava. But every once in a while, I would feel this like wave of warm air um, mm. that 
I need to like find a park ranger and ask them about this. But my guess is I'm feeling volcanic gases. Yeah. Um, like I, and and I, and so the heat I, is I still put, there. Oh, the heat is still there. And I put my hand on the ground and it was warm. Um, Geothermal stuff, maybe. Yeah. And so the hike obviously was beautiful, um, but I think the thing That's that was trippy. so incredible about it was this sort of realization that there's like so much there that you can't see and and you're just like walking through it and you're just an ant, you know, you're just this itty bitty little thing cool. walking through. Yeah. You want to do it again? Beautiful. Yeah. I do. Yes. <laughs> I should That's be so awesome. lucky. Oh man, that sounds like magic. Would you do another residency? Like oh, in a heartbeat. I I have a four year old daughter, so and I work full time, so like you know, there's logistics involved in being away for a month. But oh, absolutely, this has mm-hmm. been an incredible experience, and honestly, has uh, I think been imperative for the book I'm writing to have the dedicated wow. time. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Well, good for you. I think I think they do. I mean, I love it that you know you can have your your husband, your child, and your mom, and you know and be able to do what you want to do. And it's, I think that's really unique, special. They understand. So many that. residencies don't. And that's no. why men get them and women don't. Right. Like, ah, it's, that's a good point, huh? Yeah. Mm. To, to be inclusive of women artists and um, people with kids and, you know, it, it especially even like people with disabilities and, you know, so many, so many residencies in this world are like, it's, a month long you have to go by yourself and you're going to be in this weird isolated place um and that doesn't leave a lot of women able to go you know huh that's a that's a first yeah that's a first in all the interviews that I didn't really think about it on that level because we have interviewed so many women and men through the residency so I never realized like it was not like that on the other side so that's good info See, yeah, being able to bring your family is everything, you know. Mm-hmm. We even have a women's podcast list for NPAF, Women in the Arts. That's how we have this Women Making History, a Women Who Make History uh, podcast. It's Women of, celebrates women of the past, present, and future. And it was all Amazing. because of Tanya Ortega, <laughs> the founder. It was like a happy accident that it all came together. And it's her it's her fault. And we say that in a in a happy, <laughs> glad. It's a good fall. It was, it just happened. No, um, it was so she funny. Seems to we be able a, to draw people in. We just had a technical issue on a podcast and I was like, crap, what are we going to do? It has to air at this time, you know, and I realized, well, we've interviewed her years ago on her photography because she's a fabulous photographer. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, well, we could air it. It's women's history month, March 1st. And then we're like, well, what are you, you just going to do one? Well, what about the eighth? Because, you know, we got to do women, International Women's Day. They were like, well, square it. We're just going to do a daily show. And now we do. It's her fault. That, I mean, it, Amazing. It's, isn't that awesome? So we air <laughs> so ones cool. from the past and the present. So we haven't got to the future. You know, if you figure that out with the X on the forehead, <laughs> let me know so we can do future podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> I'll talk to a psychic. Maybe we can go. Oh, That's there you go. Or forwards in time. Or are yeah. we all in the same amount of time at the same time and we just don't know it? What is time even other than uh, oh, a boy. part of our Here filtering we... system? <laughs> at the go. end of the podcast, we ask, uh, what is time? <laughs> I know, good one. I love it. I love it. It's one month for a residency, everybody. That's it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. It has been a true pleasure having you on the show and look forward to everyone hearing it and keep us posted on your book. I will. Thank you so much. This has been (laughs) such a joy to talk to you. (laughs) Well, I want everyone to know your website. LeahNewsom.com is the website. The links are in the show notes. And of course, go to NationalParksArtsFoundation.org. The the links for them are also in the show notes. So thanks. You take care and enjoy those last few days. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for joining us here on Big Blend Radio's first Friday Toast to the Arts and Park show with the National Parks Arts Foundation. Learn more about their amazing park artist residency programs. Go to nationalparksartsfoundation.org. Keep up with our shows at bigblendradio.com.